Hey there, welcome to Culture by Culture, a multidimensional exploration of Black and Asian pop cultural ties. I'm your mixed and nerdy host, Delia, and today I'm joined by creator of Main Hustle Media, the Blasian Blurred, Charmaine Fury. Hey! Yay. Pew, 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 pew. Hi! Konnichi, what's up? I'm so happy to have you. <laughs> <laughs> I love your saying, by the way. We'll get into it. Um, Go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell the people what you what you do. What I do? Uh, hey, y'all. I'm Charmaine. I'm your Sir Auntie, Charmaine Fury, <laughs> a.k.a. The Blazing Blurred. I am the host or co-host of Militantly Mixed Blurred Comics, Matcha and Masala, a new show that's coming up. And I'm a cosplayer and just an all around mixed and nerdy and queer person. We love it. I love. <laughs> so I found Charmaine through Militantly Mixed, like, Ages ago, when I started planning the podcast, like I talked about this in other episodes, you know, I think it's super important when you're as a creator getting into the space, like see what people are already doing, mm-hmm. like what people are creating, like what's there, what's needed. Um, not that you can't overlap or anything like that. I'm not saying that, but it's just good to like, you know, no. So I found Militantly Mixed in that process and then found Charmaine in general, who is, as you as you heard, quite prolific. Like <laughs> you be podcasting. I be podcasting. <laughs> yeah, I just dropped the bomb on my co-host for Blurred Comics last night. I was like, hey, did you know I started a po- another podcast? And the look on his face on the live stream was just like, of course, <laughs> you did but also you're always complaining about being busy so what why did you do this so yeah you know sometimes we're we're our own problem you know what i'm saying (laughs) yes period it's the adhd like constantly i'm like oh look at this list of things i have to do but my like creative adhd brain's like but also but also what is yeah (laughs) yeah uh, I think that's super cool. Um, so yeah, I really love the stuff you do over there as a fellow mixed person. Like I've resonated with a lot of the stuff you posted and I know you just actually think we might've started our new seasons on the same day. Maybe I don't remember, but mm. I saw you started a new season of militantly mixed around then. Anyway, great episodes, great stuff, great content. <laughs> Go check it out. We'll <laughs> plug it all at the end, of course. Um, but I, did want to first talk about so this is a podcast about black and asian pop cultural ties but also about you know all the things that encompass that that's why i talk about it as a multi-dimensional podcast because mm-hmm. there's a lot that goes into these i think cultural interactions and one of those things i think at this point hopefully obvious to the <laughs> listeners is um you know people who come from backgrounds where these things are intertwined so i know you host a militantly mixed podcast but if you could describe for the audience who may not know the podcast yet what is your background how do you identify all that jazz so i am uh, the easy way for me to put it is that i'm a black japanese british american uh my both of my parents are biracial my father it was um black american and english welsh british um my mother is japanese and like appalachian white american um uh, so that's like English, Scottish, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Um, a mix, a mix of all that. Uh, so I grew up culturally black and what I refer to as weekend Japanese because I wasn't <laughs> able to be Japanese in the world. I was able mm-hmm. to be Japanese at grandma's house, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and so why those are my two main cultures. I also did live with my British grandma for the, for a while. So I have a, I have a smackling of British, mm-hmm. um, culture in there as well. But my primary identity for most of my life was black. And then I left Long Beach where I'm from and people started asking me what I am or where I'm from. And then I became a mixed person at that point. You know, I was Mm -hmm. always ethnically mixed, but I wasn't necessarily a mixed identity person Mm -hmm. until uh, until I left my my neighborhood where you know, black people just made room for me as black with a Japanese mom. And Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's my that's my main cultural identity i would say that i'm ethnically black japanese english welsh i'm culturally black and japanese with a little bit of british and i'm politically black in my identity love that what was that how did that realization feel when you realized oh i have this mixed identity when you exited the the space that you originally were growing up in well you know like when you don't know anything else Mm -hmm. and somebody all of a sudden makes you an other you're just like how dare you um obviously (laughs) i am the the most african queen warrior that is possible (laughs) but how can you not see that you know and Mm -hmm. that's maybe because i have straight asian hair and you know yellow brown skin and and i my features are to other people ambiguous although i know exactly what i am and can see myself just fine Mm -hmm. um 
so it, it was more of just like that thing that people kept telling me I was different. I was different. Mm -hmm. So I'm walking around with this idea of having to reconcile with being different, even though where I grew up, no one ever made me feel that way. I mean, there would be the moments like there's always these key little moments where you don't code, you know, yeah, all the way the way the rest of the neighborhood does. And um, and so in those cases, the way a friend would explain what I'm what's going on with me is she's got a Japanese mom. Now, of course, people can tell there's something else going on with me, but black people always know that I'm black. So mm -hmm. um, going to a place, a suburb that was fairly mixed, but predominantly white, uh, it was just like the frustration of becoming different after, you know, my whole mm -hmm. teen, 15 years of my life not being different necessarily. Uh, and then as I got older, I started realizing like, wait, why, why did I adopt being different? I wasn't different. Y'all were different. You know, like I, Period, this is, yeah. this was my life. Everybody I knew was mixed. My parents are biracial. My aunts and uncles, my cousins are mm -hmm. multiracial. Um, I grew up in military families, everybody, <laughs> mm -hmm, <laughs> you know, almost mm -hmm. everybody was mixed. It was almost weird to find out people were monoracial mm -hmm. in our friend groups and things like that. Um, because of how mixed a life I had. So to go from that, a very mixed life to a very monoracial life with the, you know, spattering of diversity, um, I was shocked how easy it was for me to accept what people were on the outside were telling me. And it, it takes years and years of finally just owning. And, I'll, you know, it's fair to say that it took podcasting about mixedness for me to drop the I was different. I was mm. unique. I was unusual mm -hmm. and um, and turn it back around on the people who were making me who were putting me into that box because I didn't put myself into that box. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, yeah, like it just feels like you lose yourself w without even realizing you've done it. And then 20 years goes by and all of a sudden you're like, wait a second, <laughs> how did I let, you know, the outside world do that to me? Um, and so that's a, a big motivation for Militantly Mix was to hopefully catch not just people my age that haven't broken that that cycle mm -hmm. yet, but even younger people to be like, no, be your mixed ass self. No, mm -hmm. don't let anybody tell you what you get to be. And it's okay to, to identify however you identify. And that's why I say, you know, I am politically black. I'm culturally black and Japanese. Mm -hmm. um, but my main identity is, is as a black person or what I will now say a mixed black person for, to stop some of the questions that might yeah. come to me from monoracial folks. Yeah. The, maybe this is something that we can talk about. Uh, not on my podcast, on your podcast, but <laughs> you're, you're, what was, you were making me think of uh, recently, like I've had so such a varied relationship with my mixedness, like throughout growing up, like I've like run the gamut of like how I felt about it. And for the longest time, a lot of it was how people perceived me, but then also mm -hmm. my reaction to their perception. And like fairly recently within the last year or so, I realized like on accident, I was kind of doing erasure of a whole part of my yes. identity on accident, yep. mostly because like I get I would get so tired of people being like, OK, but what are you and trying to like tell, like put me in a box that I yeah. just was like, I don't want to engage. So I'm just black and that's all you need to know. The rest of it's yeah. not your business. But in doing that, I kind of like erase this whole part of myself. Mm -hmm. So I've been like in the process for the last year and some change of like reclaiming that like, no, I'm Cherokee too. Yeah. And like, I'm equally all of this. And it's just so, you know, I don't know. I'm happy to have gone on this journey and I have a younger sister, like she's gone on her own journey, but like, it also does make me sad sometimes that I'm like, it's such a long process. Like it is. Yeah. I wish I could have had the security and like these realizations much younger. Like it's, 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 wild yeah um which is why i was so excited to find a podcast like yours because i'm like that is doing good work like i again who knows the demographics i i mean you do you have the intellect mm -hmm. so yeah. like, regardless of the demographics <laughs> like people need to talk about this because like you said i'm saying like oh i'm at this age where i'm a grown adult and still like going through this journey and it's fine that it's lifelong but some of this stuff i'm like man we should have worked this out a long time right. ago you do feel that way and and that's a, a kind of the mission with militantly mix so when militantly mix was created there were no mixed podcasts. There were some mm -hmm. dead podcasts that were created by mixed people, yeah. but there weren't any active mixed podcasts. And, and it had been over a year between the last mm -hmm. time someone published an episode and when I, when I put my show forward. And so I was trying to figure, do I have to be political? Do I have to be this? Do I have to be that? And at the end of the day, it was just talking to regular ass mixed people about being a regular ass mixed person that mm -hmm. seemed to be the most healing for myself 
mm-hmm. for the people that I was talking to. And, you know, five years later, I haven't really changed my formula too much. Um, I'm feeling like I want to. I'm ready to evolve into a yeah. different um, version of militantly mix. But uh, for the for this first five years, what it gave myself and what it gave, I think, the mixed community that was kind of growing at the time, um, a place to in community just be like, should I feel bad that I didn't, you know, like <laughs> that I didn't claim X, Y, Z, or, you know, am I too late to try to identify, you know, all that kind of stuff. We we were answering those questions by not talking about the issues, but talking about the individuals. And I think that was a big, a big deal um, when that mixed community, the, the social media version of the mixed community was starting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think it's so important because also I think, you know, from the outside, people get this idea that, Oh, you're especially I feel like I mean, that's partly maybe the bias of my experience, but like being black and mixed with whatever the case is, like I always feel like there's a flattening of our experiences like, oh, they must be very similar. But like that's not true, which is something that comes up on this podcast a lot because I've had other people who are black and Asian, like um, Filipino and Korean and now Japanese. And it's like, yes, there is a commonality to being mixed that we can gather around but there's also Mm -hmm. what i think is beautiful and inspiring is that like no one experience is going to be the same just like none of us are going to identify the same i've had friends ask me like okay so you identify as this but i've known other mixed people and it was like yeah that's valid too like it just it depends like Mm -hmm. it's going to be unique um which is also why like in this podcast i think it's so important to have voices up from the experience of mixed people because being mixed myself i'm like i know that's a unique perspective so if i'm Mm -hmm. gonna gonna talk about black and asian um cultural connections like who i know there is insight there yeah right yeah black and asian and like i just yeah i think it also like has it gives you a different perspective on the world i think also being mixed Mm -hmm. um like being treated like an other within the other it's so Mm -hmm. fascinating to me being a multiple other is Fun times for <laughs> everybody. Fun times. Yeah, it really shifts the perspective. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so I did wonder how, because of course, obviously you listed your podcast before. You're also a nerd. You cosplay. Mm-hmm. You do all of these things. And I have wondered, because I've talked to other guests about our experiences as Black people coming to like nerdy spaces, especially Black nerdy spaces, what that's been like for especially mm-hmm. like queer Black people, um, like Black women. Like it's especially over time, the fan mm-hmm. spaces, I always speak carefully because I know people have feelings, but like they've not <laughs> always been welcoming, you know? Right. And right. there's been a lot of issues and also in the media that we're consuming. So I wonder how that experience might be different being black and Asian coming into like cosplay. Like, what mm-hmm. is that like? Is there, you know, yeah, just talk to me about your experience. I'm just fascinated. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I can rewind a little bit to get to the context of being in cosplay now, but uh, similar sure. to the episode you had with your father, um, mm-hmm. where he was talking about like, uh, he's he's about 20 years older than me, but very similar things were happening between like your access to nerdery when mm-hmm. you're a black kid, you know, was was not always the easiest thing. But yet, like at home, you could have like your nerd your nerd shit at home and, Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. things. And, you know, you might be lucky if you had some nerd friends too, or whatever, but, but the culture as a whole didn't make a lot of room for, for black nerds. And I got a pass with, it was like anime and manga because people knew I had a Japanese mom, but if I brought comics around, which was what, which was actually my main nerd Mm -hmm. ness, you know, um, the only the only time I got a pass for being a comic book nerd was when Batman 89 came out. The movie came out and then mm-hmm. people everybody was into Batman. So it was OK. Uh, but, but prior to that, I couldn't I couldn't really do it. And then in 1992, X-Men cartoon cut rolls around and then everybody was into the X-Men and stuff like mm-hmm. that, too. But like you still couldn't be a, a comic book nerd. That was still not going to be OK. And so I would have to go to the the Korean liquor store in my neighborhood and grab like whatever comics they had on the spinner mm-hmm. rack, which was basically like, you know, maybe oh, five man. comics at a time. Yeah. yeah and yeah. I'd have to like throw it in my bag real fast, throw the money down. The Korean lady would yell at me to get out. And then, <laughs> you know, then I'd have to like try to hide it from my friends that so um the the stories that I tell about that have to do with like I have the show Bl- Blurred Comics, which is a podcast mm-hmm. where me and my childhood friend, um, who are both mixed black, 
uh, talk about cosplay, nerd shit, comic books, all kinds of things. But the thing is, the reason why we do this show is because we did not know in our whole lifetime, we've known each other since we were eight years old. Uh, we did not know the other person was a comic book nerd. Because that's how wow. deep anti nerdness in black community was. And it, it didn't just come from inside the community, it came from outside of the community too. Comic books were for white kids, white guys, white boys. Um, so we didn't have that access. And it wasn't, and we've stayed friends. Like I've moved around a lot. So I say I'm from Long Beach, but I was actually born in Sacramento and then I moved to Long Beach and then I came back to Sacramento as a teenager. And so Sean Bay and I have a very close childhood relationship. We spent time in each other's houses, you know, like all kinds of stuff and did not know the other one was into nerd shit. And then in our 30s, I end up posting something when I start to be more out of the closet about it. I ended up posting something on Facebook and and he like private messages me like, wait, did you read comics when you were a kid? And I was like, yeah, bro. And that ended up creating this relationship of like, we don't really know each other. Like we we know each other, but we don't know this part of each other and we both were comic book nerds we both had stacks and stacks so like why didn't we get to have that part of our relationship so we started the podcast to like reclaim an, a portion of our relationship that would have been nice to have with your friend that you've had since you were eight years old we're 45 right now you know what i'm saying like it's mm -hmm. so crazy that we didn't we went through so much of our life as friends without knowing that about each other and um which moves me into the cosplay world. So mm -hmm. I uh, Halloween became a, a, was always a really fun thing for me growing up. And then it became a taboo when my dad decided to become a born again. Um, and so this <laughs> idea of like not having access to being able to like cheat into nerd room, you know, mm -hmm. like I could use Halloween as the reason why I'm dressed as Batgirl or some shit mm -hmm. like that. Right. Um, uh, when that goes away, this desire to like, embody the characters that I loved so much went away too. So as an adult, I went hard into Halloween. Like I just mm -hmm. went the crazy hard, like, uh, you know, $700 costumes and things Amazing. like that. Because I was like, oh I was trying to make up for like my lost mm -hmm. childhood time. And uh, my, my husband and I would throw these parties and stuff like that. And it was like the only time of year I was really social. And then I started to remember Hey, I used to go to Comic Cons when I was a kid. My aunt used to take me to them and people used to dress up. And I, you know, cosplay was just like barely starting to be mm -hmm. a thing. And so I I was still kind of dipping my toe. I still would, I would go to Comic Cons, I would do comic book stuff, and I would not dress up except for Halloween. I'd go nuts. And um, and then finally I thought, okay, I'm I'm nervous to try this because I don't know how I'm gonna be received because I don't look like any comic book character. Cause that felt like a very important thing. Black people couldn't cosplay certain people because they didn't no. look like the character. They want the same race. <laughs> Asian people technically couldn't even cosplay Asian characters because white people would freak out um, mm -hmm. because they don't seem to understand that while the while the people in anime might look like you, they're not you. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, they're they're Asian. You know? um, and uh, so I decided to dress as Jubilee. For the okay. very first time where it's an intentional cosplay mm -hmm. in for comic book purposes. And I thought, you know. Here's how I can relate to Jubilee. She is a transracial adoptee, a Chinese child adopted by white people and um, is, is a mutant. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a mixed Asian. <laughs> My parents aren't the same color as me either. Mm -hmm. uh, so like this was me literally trying to justify connection to a character um, just to be able to validate it. And um, I so I get my stuff together. I, I go to WonderCon in I think it was gosh, it was so late. It's like 2019 is the mm -hmm. first time I, I legitimately consider this is cosplay wow. versus a Halloween costume. Mm -hmm. And um, I go with with Sean Bay from Blurred Comics and a couple of my other podcast nerd friends. And people were stopped. Like, I didn't even think I had the best Jubilee costume out there. I just had a I got a yellow raincoat. I had some jean shorts. I got a mm -hmm. pink shirt. You know, like it was legit just piecemeal cosplay. Mm -hmm. uh, I had blue rain boots and gloves and stuff like that. And people kept stopping me. And taking pictures, asking me to take pictures. And then even better, an X-Men would come up and stop me and be like, Julie, okay. can I take a picture with you? And I'd be like, yes, I like you can take a picture with me. You know, <laughs> and then like the professional guys that walk around the cons taking pictures were at stopping me to take pictures and handing me the card so that I can download the picture later. And that feeling was so crazy it was drug like it was just mm -hmm. euphoric i just i was jubilee to people that day mm -hmm. 
And I think it had to do with me kind of being a vaguely Asian, you know, presenting person and stuff like that. And, and, but that part wasn't as important to me at the time. And so then I just started to pick things that I enjoy. I like to gender bend costumes quite a bit because I am a bi gender person. So mm-hmm. I, I have a, I say I have a binary identity. And, um, and so I started doing that and I wouldn't often get questioned too often about things mm-hmm. until I dressed as Shinobu. <laughs> From Demon Slayer. Oh, okay. Which is in fucking insane because I am Japanese. I like I understand uh-huh. that I'm mixed uh-huh. and I don't look like an East Asian necessarily or, or something like that. But right. I was walking around New York Comic Con as Shinobu and literal white people telling me like the hair wasn't, you know, or or like no. not even telling me, like saying it what? as I walk past. Like I have purple hair. Like right now my front is blue, but my back is is purple. Like I have purple hair. Um I just I styled it in a way that was similar. I had the full tilt cosplay, the whole thing or whatever. But it was white people trying to tell me or just talk about is. me in my Sorry. presence. <laughs> yeah. Like how insane that is. And then these two really tall white guys walk past me. And lo- and I say really tall because it's part of the imagery of what ha- the experience of it is I walk past them and I've got my sword and I'm walking. And these two tall, tall white guys, like twice my height practically look down on me. And one says, Shh, like, I'm not standing there. She kind of looks Japanese. That's a good Shinobu. She kind of looks Japanese and then kept walking. And in my head, my first reaction was like, well, they're not wrong. <laughs> that's, just, that's just hilarious. It's like, well, they're actually right, though. I do kind of <laughs> look Japanese on account of I'm mixed Japanese. But it was the fact that they felt the, the space and the entitlement mm-hmm. to voice that out loud while I'm standing there yeah. in my full regalia. But then I started to find the Black Demon Slayer cosplayers. And my whole, I got my whole life that day. Like Mm -hmm. we were stopping each other. We were posing together. We were making little videos and all kinds of stuff. And none of us knew each other. We Mm -hmm. were just like, it was you, me, you, we're the same. And we would congregate and it was all day long. And it was so, it was, it was exactly my experience as a black Japanese person. I am at all times black and I am at all times Japanese Mm -hmm. and inside a, a Japanese character cosplay surrounded by black cosplayers that are doing similar things that I was and feeling like we were feeling I like it all it all crystallized and made sense and so Mm -hmm. I find that now because of that experience uh I don't care what I dress as you're gonna I'm not the black version I'm not the Japanese version I'm not the mixed version I'm that character that's what I've chosen to embody today and that's what I'm embodying um but it took being around black cosplayers specifically black anime cosplayers Mm -hmm. that made me finally make sense of of granting myself permission like i would tend to to do characters that had some kind of ambiguity Mm -hmm. Uh, i was a a femme gambit i was Mm -hmm. a a femme joker you know like things like that or whatever uh something that would uh, allow my i guess light skin to be a part of the story without Mm -hmm. being you know questioned and things uh now i don't care but I needed I needed the experience of being around black uh, anime cosplayers specifically to to bust that open. It was so. That's so beautiful. It was like I, the most best thing ever. <laughs> I, like, I'm sorry you had that experience with the mm. the, you know, the white nerds in the space. But that's see, that's the thing. Like, I'm partly disheartened to hear that that's still going on because I never cause well, never got into cosplay I should say rather because at the time Mm -hmm. like for me this is back in like 2006 2007 I had my best friend at the time uh, she was getting so into cosplay and she was white um, and like she took up sewing like did the whole thing like she was into it and uh, we would go to cons together and she'd want me to kind of cosplay with her I also didn't have money that was also part of it Fair, Um, (laughs) it's very expensive Um, and at the time it was like I didn't even like doing it because without fail like it was just tons of comments it didn't matter who i was like no i'm supposed to be itachi they're like yeah mm, no you're not or no. at best they may be like oh so you're blitachi like yeah black right. itachi. Yes. like i couldn't ha- hold the space and so i just kind of turned away from cosplay altogether i'm like this is not my bag i'm it's not worthwhile mm-hmm. like i love it as an art form a craft i think it's so cool people who can do it and so i'm sad to hear like that 
why people are so out here like this, like critiquing people being like, oh, you don't look Japanese enough. At least they got to the point where they realized anime characters were Japanese, I guess. But <laughs> like on the flip side, though, there's so many black cosplayers now that have built community that have been through, you know, mm-hmm. all of the things and can lift each other up. And I think that part, that's really beautiful. Yeah. My first experience of actually seeing like full tilt black cosplay community. I went to Dragon Con last summer, mm-hmm. uh, not this year, the prior and they have all these photo shoots at every con. Everybody's mm-hmm. used to like character based photo shoots. So if you're X Men, we're doing an X Men photo shoot. But, but at Dragon Con was one of the first times I ever saw like an all black cosplay thing. So you'd have your general all black cosplayers, and then you'd have your your categories. So your your Marvels, your DC, your fantasy, what whatever, and they would break them out. Um, and so I went there with a friend, and um, I did not choose to jump into the picture that day. Um, mm-hmm. you know, part of that is, you know, self-invalidation and mm-hmm. whatever, blah, blah, blah. Uh, having to answer too many questions to people who saw the greater photo, you know, like the mm-hmm. bride or fire, like, what's that, <laughs> what's that yellow brown doing? You know, whatever. <laughs> um, so I decided to opt out, but my friend went in it and I sat on the outside of it watching, you know, the organization of it and the joy that, ex- that ex- was there or the way you would fan out when you saw somebody dress as somebody, you know, like Mm -hmm. that experience is also, I think a big part of the cosplay experience where, whether you're in it or outside of it, Mm -hmm. when you see somebody who is just nailing something and the friend that I went with was dressed as um, the T'Challa star Lord. Okay. Mm -hmm. His cosplay is it's, it's such a perfect one and it's pieced Mm -hmm. together too. It's not like it was, you know, bought in in a full kit or anything like that, but it's so perfect. And people were stopping him like crazy and, uh, you know, as soon as we walk up and they're like, oh, make, get over here because we want to make sure we can see you and things. And that that sense of like non-competition, but just mm-hmm. joy uh, is not something that I see in other communities of cosplayers. Um, I do see like, oh, you're not as good as fill in the blank famous cosplayer. Like yeah. you'll hear that happen. And it doesn't really happen in in the black cosplay community. And then everybody fucking just knows each other. And so mm-hmm. at that point, we were just meeting so many people and some of them I was already like Facebook friends with or online, you know, because I I have my podcast and things like that. Uh, but but getting a chance to sit down and meet people in person, I've now developed relationships with these people. Mm-hmm. And now they're multi-con relationships because I'm seeing them at Dragon Con and then I see them in New York. And, mm-hmm. you know, um, and I live in Mexico right now. I moved to Mexico this earlier this year. So I haven't experienced a con this year, unfortunately. But um, that sense of family, like, oh, mm-hmm. I can't wait. Because, ne- you know, after I settle my my house stuff here in Mexico, I'm going to plan my future annual cons and stuff. And and it part of that is, oh, I hope a foo is going to be there. I hope uh, Bishop Cosplay is going to be there. I hope mm-hmm. Pie, you know, is going to be there. and things like that where you can legit just be like there's certain people. Um, well, I haven't met Cutie Pie yet. I'm just putting that out in the universe. <laughs> uh, but like, there's certain people you know? that I know and I'm friends with that I hope to get a chance to to be around. And then there's the ones who I've now seen at multiple cons that I've I've developed. I'll say at least a cosplay friendship because it's not like we're you know DMing each other all the time mm-hmm. or something like that. But every now and then, you know, yeah, I've, I've helped some. I've helped one really famous cosplayer with an HR problem at work, and um, okay, I, and I was really <laughs> excited about that because we just happened to have that conversation, and the DM came through. Was like, I think I remember you saying you used to work in HR, and I was like, yeah. And they're like, can you help me with this? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> so you know, like that thing that turns this thing that you both find joyful into Mm -hmm. personal relationships of you know there's this thing we understand about each other because we're cosplayers but also now we have real life relationships and 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 we don't have to be uncomfortable about the fact that like yeah that is a batman onesie in my Mm -hmm. closet that you can see right now you know like you don't have to you don't have to be weird about it anymore yeah for sure I know you talked about earlier at the beginning of this episode about being growing up feeling like you were like weekend Japanese, I think mm-hmm. you said. Yeah. Um, and I wondered if that affected how you approached nerd media, especially as you got into like cosplay and anime, because I know you yeah. said people kind of gave you a pass for that. But did that uh, like affect at all how you approached it and how you enjoyed it versus like comic books or what have you? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I I the anime that I love. I am ride or die for. And it's Mm -hmm. all the stuff that I grew up with. It's all the stuff that came on either beta or VHS tapes from Japan that my cousins or my family members would tape and just like 
Awesome. My grandmother would get these like care packages and would have all these videos. And it'd be like the game show that was really famous at the time was called Waldo. And we would watch those tapes. And then every now and then there would be a Gojira or an um, Otoromura man and a Spider Man. And, mm-hmm. and then there would be like the occasional anime. So like I had access to Voltron before it became, it came to the United States and I had access to a, a few things. And then as I got older, I started seeking out things that were, um, like uh, Yoko Mamuno Hanta was a big one mm-hmm. for me when I was a teenager and um, a Basilisk and stuff like that, a Witchblade and things. And then I just stopped watching anime full tilt because mm-hmm. I was like, you know what? I There's things that I love. And once white people started to enjoy it, the way they consumed it mm-hmm. was like, they didn't understand what they were consuming. Yeah. And the mm-hmm. way they enjoy it is very frustrating for to me too because as a as a Japanese person, what I understand about manga and and anime in particular is that the reason it exists is because of the bomb. Yep. Mm-hmm. Japanese art beforehand was very n- natural, very peaceful. It could be life depicting and things like that or whatever, but it was it was return to nature type stuff. It, was, it that's what it was. And then the bomb hit. And that's when we started getting monsters. That's when we started mm-hmm. getting kaiju. That's when we started getting demons. These things weren't a part of Japanese culture until after um, the horrors that people experienced. And so when you're watching your little favorite anime fandom, mm-hmm. uh, and mind you, I understand that now there's a lot of things. There's like romance and there's, you know, food things yeah. and stuff like that. It's not always um, kaiju or demons or things like that. But the or the early days of of anime was very much this. It was a culture processing trauma. Mm-hmm. And as a, a, you know, black person, as a Japanese person in America and things like that, understanding trauma in through art is just a Tuesday, you mm-hmm. know, like it's just yeah. regular everyday life. Right. And um, to see white people just be like, you know, Dragon Ball Z and Naruto and stuff like that. It's just like. Yeah, but do you understand why this exists? Do you understand? Like, I, I know that we can just enjoy things and consume things, but comics are not that much different from that. A lot of times the artists or the creators of these characters are processing some form of frustration or trauma mm-hmm. in the characters that they create. And so that crossed for me between comics and and anime. And I, I understand that like, you know, white people were already enjoying comics and everything like that. But I was able to find something in characters that they couldn't find in Mm -hmm. characters. And then with an anime, I was able to understand that this demon, this kaiju, this monster that you're experiencing is a a direct reaction to the fact that they they literally saw their family members melt before their eyes in Mm -hmm. some cases, you know, and it, it was very traumatic. And that stuff passes down. What I have in me, because my grandma grew up in World War II, mm-hmm. um, like a, a hoardiness because I'm afraid to let my possessions go, um, not being able to let food expire, you mm-hmm. know, not being able to let things go to waste. This is trauma that she had that she didn't process before I came around. And now it's mine, too. Yeah. And so that's my connection. That's what I feel like when I'm experiencing this. It's a it's a way to process um, grief and trauma and and things. Uh, and then as a cosplayer, it's a way to find joy through that process, you know, mm-hmm. to to embody something fun. And I know it doesn't make sense, the connection, but it does. It just, you mm-hmm. know, it's just a way for you to to process things. And I, I find that cosplay can be a very therapeutic experience. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's insanely expensive and I don't have nearly the amount of cosplays that I that I would want to have. So I tend to show up as Jubilee quite often. Mm-hmm. Partly because Jubilee's who brought me to the dance, but also partly because uh, I can afford her. <laughs> you know, I can afford to do her. Um, and uh, it's just, yeah, but it's just a way for me to to find a non. I don't have to pay for a therapist to help me get through this because I have I can be Jubilee today, or I can be mm-hmm. Gambit, or if I'm feeling a little terrorizy today, I might be a little Joker. And yeah. You know, like that um so yeah it, the japanese aspect of it was that i understood anime in a in a different way and watching white people consume it uh kind of made me separate <laughs> it, it just mm. made me stop watching it so i actually haven't watched a whole lot in in recent years except for uh i went through my bleach phase which i only lasted like up to like 13 discs 
that's how mm-hmm. long ago I watched Bleach. So <laughs> discs, I got to yeah. 13 discs from, <laughs> from Netflix. Uh, and then I did get into Demon Slayer last year and, um, and became pretty obsessed with like, because uh, Tangelo makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. his role in his family is very similar to my role in my family and and stuff. so again like i'm not just here for the the fun of it i'm actually right. experiencing something uh, personal familial whatever through it um so that yeah that's why i ended up getting getting into that uh but the weekend japanese was really because being mixed mm-hmm. my grandma didn't want people to know we were black and so mm-hmm. i wasn't often a family member if we if we encountered people she knew in the wild, I was the child of a friend of hers that she was watching that day or something like that. Something that made me not. Wow. Because they were always worried because black people would come up to me and be like, you black. And I'm like, yep. You know, and then, mm-hmm. you know, they'd move on with their lives. And my grandma would be like, why did they ask you that? And I was like, cause they can tell that I'm black and they just wanted confirmation, right. you know? And so she was nervous that Asians and Japanese people in particular would figure that out too. And so we we had to hide it. Even from my extended family, I didn't start telling my extended family that I uh, was black until I was 25. It was the first time I told one of my cousins. Um, that is fascinating to me. Yeah, because, <laughs> yeah I mean, that, it's horrible. Like, yeah. it's horrible, but also fascinating to me just because, you know, we talk about in the black community, like, we could tell it's like, oh, hey, yeah. You, you one of us, right? You like, you could be one thirty second, you know, like and yeah. something will pop up and someone will be like, I see it. It's incognito. Um, yeah, exactly. But so the uh, fact that like you not only had to hide, were forced to, but successfully did so is yeah. wild to me. <laughs> yeah. So actually, when I told one of my cousins, I've told the show, my the story of my show a bunch. One of my cousins, I told him um, when I was like 25, I told him, you know, I'm black. You know, my dad's black. And he's like, do you know what we call you in the family? And my, like, I can remember my body just tensing up and being like, what? I'm like, what, what, what and, did they call you? And he said, cause me and my brother was so Brown when we were kids, like we'd spend summer in mm-hmm. Hawaii where most, a lot of my Japanese family now lives and stuff. And so we get, you know, hella Brown. And, um, and so he's like, we call you guys the Mexicans. And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> and so like so there's like not even Charmaine and my brother's name or anything like that, but literally like, hey, the Mexicans are coming for the summer. You know what I'm saying? Like because we were so brown and every time they asked us what our father was, we would we were taught to say American. So whatever that meant to the Japanese side was what it meant. And um, and so but because we were tanned so dark when we were younger. Um, yeah, they thought we were Mexican. <laughs> I so, am aghast. <laughs> <laughs> like I laugh at it now, but in the, when I heard it, I was just like, by this point, I think my great grandparents were still alive, but I hadn't gotten a chance to see them. Like I had last seen them mm-hmm. when I was 18. And um, so I didn't get a chance to see them before they died. And I was like 27, 29 around uh, um, when my last great grandparent mm-hmm. died. And I was just like, I'll never be able to look at them in the face knowing <laughs> that they thought I was Mexican the whole time and it's not that they thought I was Mexican it's just that they needed to decide for us what we needed were to decide and also wouldn't say it to your face that's I mean right. like it's like, so, because that's also a very Japanese thing is like yeah. the family secret so I have a cousin that I can share some secrets to and they can share some secrets to me that I, I haven't heard it get around I have another cousin that I will intentionally say things that are slight off of the truth mm-hmm. to see where it surfaces and it always surfaces you know so like i know which yeah. cousin not to tell somebody you know something to but for the most part japanese don't like to talk about stuff like i had two yeah. great aunts that had um, cancer multiple times and didn't tell the family until their la- their most recent remission wow so like japanese we keep it tight and uh and, and then here i am on a podcast telling all my family business <laughs> <laughs> um, second generation American. Uh, but yeah, like that's why I was weekend Japanese because I didn't get to be, I, I felt very culturally Japanese. My, my f- main food for a lot of my life was Japanese and stuff, but, um, but I didn't feel comfortable being Japanese out in public because my mm-hmm. family dictated that for me. Right. Mm-hmm. And so as an adult, it took me years to own my Japanese-ness outside of just telling people I'm black and Japanese, but like to own it, own it, to have an identity uh, that took really, again, podcasting is why I'm out here being my mixed ass self, which in the beginning I was always mixed main or, you know, that little mixed girl or, oh, Charmaine, mm-hmm. the mixed one. You know, I understood what people saw and what people understood about me. 
but my identity as mm-hmm. a mixed person really didn't crystallize until I started my podcast. Man, that is wild. And this is what I'm talking about. You know, there's a commonality between mixed people and sharing that experience, but each experience is so unique um, Mm -hmm. and informed by the culture that we're bringing to the table. And I think that's super interesting and wonder how did that affect your ability to have like ownership in these nerd spaces? Because I know you Mm kind of like moved away from anime because of how white people took it in, which is to say very casually not engaging on that you know, deeper level, but like, did you feel comfortable with your discomfort at that point where, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, like you just kind of move. It's just in the background at that point, comics, it was easier for me to be an out of the closet comic book nerd. Um, Mm -hmm. It it started to be something that people associated with me and my friend groups are out in the world as well. Um, So it was okay. Uh, Now that I'm seeing that, that like black people have embraced anime so much, um, uh, you know, trying to dip back in what I'm noticing is like, oh, you haven't seen One Piece yet? You can't even start One Piece now. You know, like that is the way it's happening to me in the black community. It's not yeah. like it's it doesn't feel the same where white people were white people. Where you're obviously not an anime character fan <laughs> because of blah, blah, blah. Whereas black people are just kind of making fun of you for being yeah. late in the game. Which is, you know, that's that's comforting. I'm black. Yeah. Being made fun of for not knowing shit is black comfort. I don't know how to explain it. It just is. It's how we relate to one another. You know what it I'm just saying? is. So, <laughs> like to to roll up in a cosplay and I say, "Who's that?" and or "What are you?" and they're like, "You don't know about this." <laughs> that 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 like initial um, embarrassment or whatever that you might feel kind of washes away because of the way the mm-hmm. poetry that is going to be how you get made fun of for it. Yeah. Um, that part I really enjoy. So, you know, I am watching more now um, than, than I have in the past, but I, I, I guess the way I'm also owning it too, because the, oh gosh, to be a Japanese person who doesn't know every single cause, uh, every single anime is infuriating in a white yeah. space, in a predominantly yeah. white space. Um, them questioning your Japanese-ness and stuff like that. Like, that's stuff I don't need from any monoracial person or yeah. anybody at all. Period. But in particular, with a monoracial white person who, who, who like, maybe took Japanese class, so they speak a little bit more Japanese than me or whatever. That kind of stuff. I, I don't need any of that, and I, I am very frustrated by it. So it does take me out of participating in, um, I would say, mainstream American mm-hmm. anime spaces. Yeah. But sure. um, in in small tilts, like if there's an anime section at a co- comic con and there's black people around, boom, I will be mm-hmm. there. Now, what I don't have is a Japanese community or Japanese American community outside of a few mixed Japanese people that I know, where we all mm-hmm. share very similar otherness, you know, mm-hmm. from from the Japanese community itself. Um, but not all of them are nerds, so I I yeah. haven't found my my version of that that doesn't include like literally my cousin (laughs) you know a cousin that i'm closest to or something like that so yeah having come to anime at a time where white people had already like made their claim quote unquote in the at least in the american fan culture space is very frustrating and was super frustrating growing up. Um, also, you know, as somebody who wasn't, you know, a cishet dude mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. on top of that as well, uh, you know, not only are they having a more casual relationship with the media than you are, and this, to be honest, goes beyond like Asian pop culture. Like this is just in fandom spaces kind of yeah. point blank period. Um, th- they really, you know, like you said, they gatekeep it a lot. And so I can't imagine the gatekeepiness on top of oh now there's this ex- expectation to, to perform because culturally oh i should know shouldn't i yeah like i can't it's already when i look back on my memories it's already infuriating sometimes thinking of the experiences i had and the way i was not chased out of spaces that sounds extreme but you know kind of pushed out and yeah. kind of just like you know what i'm not engaging with this At like i was talking not about made to feel welcome right and exactly w- what's so crazy about that is like you're not even in the club white dude how yeah. are you gatekeeping my club <laughs> This is my culture. This is my ethnicity. And, you know, if I turn it back around on you, like, do you know every fill in the blank white thing? You know, like, do you know every (laughs) baseball stat from 100 years? Do you have you watched every this, you know, like whatever? Tell me all the NBC sitcoms that have aired since 1950, whatever. (laughs) What happened on episode 71 of 
Seinfeld at 11 <laughs> minutes and 14 seconds. You know, the way in which they get down to that nugget in in anime that and you're not even a member of the society, you're not even a member of the club, uh, but you're going to tell me I'm not doing my part or I'm not doing a good enough job. I don't know why that is the way people embrace fandom, because you know what I get excited about? Oh, you watch Dragon Ball 2? You know, like mm-hmm. I, I've never watched it, but you know what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. if I found another if I was a hood kid who found another kid that was interested in Spider-Man the way I was interested in Spider-Man, mm-hmm. that would have been amazing. And I would have had crazy cred because I'd be like, guess what? I have Spider-Man from japan you know oh, like, i could have been bringing like at your house OG, after school every you know day <laughs> it would have been amazing so my reaction to finding out that you and i share a fandom is dope let's figure out if we can be friends over this thing right and then mm-hmm. you know you might not find you might find out you're not friends you just like the same shit you might find out that like now you have a best friend in this area right but with white fandom and spaces, it's always questioning. It's always invalidating and credentials. Yeah, you know, credentials and stuff like that. And first of all, like that's not the black community I experience. I don't experience the you're not black enough community and stuff like that. So I don't ever, I don't have the preparation for being constantly invalidated in my fandom <laughs> or in my blackness in the way in which a white cis heterosexual anime fan will try to invalidate both my Japanese-ness and my commitment to the game Mm -hmm. um, because I haven't watched One Piece or whatever, you know. And Shampi, I'm so sorry. I'm not watching. I'm not doing all those episodes. That's just me personally. But (laughs) (laughs) I I got to the point where I was like, I kind of want to because some of the cosplay is so fun (laughs) that I I kind of want to start. It is, right? And I'm like, okay, so let me try. And then I get here to Mexico and Mexican Netflix only has it in Japanese and Spanish with only Japanese or Spanish subtitles. And I only watch anime in Japanese because, you know, I'm I'm not a dub person. I, I refuse. Um, but <laughs> I I can't read Spanish yet, so I'm going to miss out. So um, yeah. until I can get my VPN stuff to not kick me out. Um, I yeah, I haven't been watching. I haven't started it yet. But yeah, there's some cosplays like I'll know it's related to to um One Piece. I'm curious about it because I think I can pull it off, but me not knowing the character, me not knowing anything, I'm like, what if I end up cosplaying going hard for this character and it turns out that they're like a Nazi or something like that? You know, whatever. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so I want to know the info before I yeah. jump into somebody's cosplay. But um, but yeah, some of the cosplay is actually the reason why I now want to watch a thousand episodes of something (laughs) yeah actually um the way fandom can this is kind of an aside but the way fandom can actually pull you into the Mm. media more than Mm -hmm. anything the media is doing on its own that's the whole reason i am now obsessed with jujutsu kaisen the fan art was going hard then i listened to some of the ost i was like okay that goes pretty hard and now i'm like plugged in and obsessed like i cannot speak well enough of jujutsu kaisen everybody should watch jujutsu kaisen anyway sorry uh, let me get back on track and we're back, um, and we're back. Uh, i've talked about this a lot on the podcast and i really wanted to know your thoughts coming at mm-hmm. it especially as somebody who's black and japanese in like specific specifically the anime space but In general, like I talk about how as a mixed person, Mm -hmm. I am so fascinated and would love to see more black representation in anime. K-dramas is something I watch a lot. Um, Chinese dramas, all of these things. And, you know, a lot for a long time, there's been this debate, especially in anime spaces. It's always, why is it always anime? Anyway, you know, like, Mm -hmm. oh, it's a homogenous. Because Japan is a supremacist culture also. So yeah, it bleeds through. Yeah, it does. And so people are like, it's a homogenous culture, yada, yada, yada. You don't like, they're Japanese, not black. And like, as a mixed person, I'm like, I didn't even need to know stat. I'm like, there are black people there. Like, it just like, there are black people there there living this experience. And as a mixed person, like, I'm just so curious about mixed people's experiences living in Korea, Japan, China, Mm -hmm. wherever, because I know it's going to be different outside of the American context, being mixed Mm -hmm. in America is going to be a completely different experience. So I always talk about on this podcast, like I'm dying for these stories, but I'm also not black and Japanese or black and Korean. So like, Mm -hmm. I don't, I can only 
gather so much from the cultural nuances as somebody on the outside. So I was just curious what your thoughts and or hopes for black and black and Asian representation within specifically anime, but any of the Asian pop culture space. When it comes to anything that's related to black and East Asianness, so mm-hmm. Korea, China or or Japan, but Japan specifically because of my identity, mm-hmm. it's it's one acknowledging that we exist in our own identity and not the identity that uh, Western and European cultures have brought to East Asia. So yes. a lot of the times, um, you know, like, let's say, for example, Thundercats, everybody I grew up with had accepted Panthero as a black man. Mm-hmm. Yes, he's a panther, but um we knew what he was you know what i'm saying like it was that was the thing that was happening whereas in anime in particular the way that um like a black character shows up is what is clearly an american anti-black stereotype mm-hmm. pushed through like a sieve of japanese-ness like it's just yeah. shaken out and then it becomes this even crazier racist um stereotype caricature Mm -hmm. uh than than what it would just have been even in the states you know if i'm honest like it's it's usually wild and Mm -hmm. and as a black japanese the second i see it i'm like oh gosh because then it's hard to separate yourself from you know what i know that even in me who looks i guess dominican but uh vaguely asian you know there are times Mm -hmm. when i am now seen asian especially when my when i shaved my head and my hair was growing out uh asian boy style um Mm -hmm. uh, people finally could see my east asian is if i show up in a japanese space i'm i'm not japanese for multiple reasons because i wasn't born japan which is the main identity that japanese people hold um Mm -hmm. because i'm american because i'm mixed you know, there's multiple things that remove me from Japanese-ness. And then on top of it, I'm mixed with Black. So I'm even less a real thing mm-hmm. in, in their mind, even though Black Japanese people exist there and have been forever. Mm-hmm. Um, the it, It's frustrating because you cannot convince Japanese people as a whole that Europeans and Americans are wrong mm-hmm. about the portrayal of Black people. Um and it, so that's very frustrating. It's really hard to get. So until more black animators and things like that are in Japan, which is now starting to happen, mm-hmm. um, you're not going to start to really see a huge shift in the way black representation is done in in anime. And then I've had guests on my show that are black Asian mixes. And so one guest in particular um, for my first ever, like my first 10 episodes, I, I forget what number. I think it was like five or four or something. Uh, five maybe was uh, Milton Washington. He he's a black Korean man who was um, the product of a, an American GI stationed mm-hmm. in Korea and a comfort woman and then adopted mm-hmm. by a black American family. And so he was he remembers Korea. He was a child in, in foster care in uh, uh, orphanages in Korea. And then he, he came to America and stuff like that. But in the way in which he despite being born in Korea, despite speaking Korean was not seen or perceived as Korean by his own people. Mm -hmm. And then he comes here and he's, you know, some kind of black, you know, like black people would accept him, but every now and then, just like with me, you know, every now and then you do something that doesn't code, you know, Mm -hmm. hundred percent. And, and so they end up questioning it and you just sit there and and like everybody's stereotypes is sitting on you in Korea. He was slicky boy, which meant like, devious Mm -hmm. dv you know Mm -hmm. like because he was black you know and and in america you know he had different experiences of of not being Mm -hmm. asian enough not being black enough and stuff like that and so i see stuff like you know i hear things like that or i see how the portrayal is in anime i i don't consume that much um korean or chinese stuff yet Mm -hmm. uh although i went through my korean horror phase about 10 years ago when when they were doing horror crazy and when Mm -hmm. black people would show up there they were usually a villain of some sort Mm -hmm. too so like i would want to see i would want them to trust uh in particular uh black folks or uh black asian mixes in Mm -hmm. their culture i would like them to trust that what we say about our experience is true uh, in the same way that we fight for that in the U.S. as well, um, and maybe just give us a little bit of grace in our representation, because even in our famous athletes like Naomi Osaka or Rio Hachimura, um, they're not Japanese enough, mm-hmm. even when they're winning yep. for Japan. 
Mm-hmm. And um, and the way that that is still an issue because it's a very and I, I use the term supremacist instead of just homogenous because of all the <laughs> of all the East Asian cultures, uh, Japanese are Japanese. Mm-hmm. Y'all are Asian. Mm-hmm. They feel separate. They behave mm-hmm. separate. They have their own island. They're hella north, you know, like all kinds yeah. of things make them feel separate. And um, and so that behavior, that that way that they represent represent themselves pops up in my life mm-hmm. and my family and in and in uh pop culture and stuff like that too. So yeah, I would absolutely I would love better representation. But um the first thing we have to do is knock down their reliance on the supremacy of Western culture. If they can mm-hmm. if they can get rid of that and they can start seeing people for what they are, it would be, it would be really quite nice. But I think it'll take generations and generations. And since the Japanese aren't <laughs> reproducing at a fast enough speed, I don't have hope <laughs> that yeah. Japanese will ever really um make a lot of room. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's so rough because even having conversations with black friends in America who maybe aren't into like say the K-pop, K drama anime whatever whatever your your fandom of choice is um who are in these spaces talking to them about like as outsiders and you know their perception of the racism and stuff which is valid but also like reckoning with but that's also because they're taking in western media and what mm-hmm. is what what is the west is one of their biggest exports white supremacy so like yeah. dis- t- untangling all of that is just so complex and and it's hard to know where to start and it's so nuanced and you know i really don't have a space to have these conversations with nuance but yeah it does feel sometimes i'm like we're generations off this like i i just want better for all of us because it it bleeds through right like if we have good representation in say like we're speaking more specifically about anime like these white fans would have representation of hopefully Black Japanese people, like, oh, those people exist. Like, it mm-hmm. can shift even the conversations we're having at a New York City Comic Con. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah. It, it trickles down, and I think it has to start behind the scenes. That is something I've come to realize, which I think is going to take longer, actually, frankly, because I think it's very mm-hmm. easy to, like, as a marketing ploy, stick somebody who looks different in front of the camera, but it's a lot yeah. harder to give them control, like you're saying, of the narrative and trust mm-hmm. trusting these people within your culture. Um, but I hope I I dream. It's one of my dreams. Like not even joking. I'm like, oh, yeah. imagine, imagine. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Because those are the narratives that some of the narratives I'm most curious about. Again, because there's that commonality of the mixed experience, and I just am curious about what it's like across different cultures. Maybe one day. I mean, with Japan, it's tough because they're even in the separate provinces or like the people that are. Japanese and I'm doing that like quotes, Mm -hmm. um, but they're different Japanese, you know, like Mm -hmm. there's different ethnicities within the islands. And yet Mm -hmm. people don't like to remember that that exists. But um, the way that Okinawans are viewed from, you know, mainland Japanese, uh, they mostly speak the same language. I mean, there's dialect differences and sometimes it is hard to understand each other or something like that. But like the stereotypes that exist for Okinawans aren't much different than some of the stereotypes that would exist, you know, for the way like black people are viewed here or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and and while it's haha funny, <laughs> Okinawans are always late, uh, you know, that way, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. that thing, like there's literally a term for it, Okinawa Jikan, uh, which is like you're on Okinawan time. Okay. And that would be it's something that CP time, but okay. You know what I'm <laughs> yeah. So that's something that would give like a Japanese person a way to make fun of their friend who's late by also saying you're acting like an Okinawan. So it's not much different than how like, you know, racism plays out here it too, mm-hmm. or I'm saying here, I'm in Mexico, but in the U S in particular in the West, um, mm-hmm. you know, here's some funny, ha ha ha, you know, not really harmful stereotypes that actually are quite harmful, but we're, mm-hmm. we're just going to pretend it's light and funny. Um, and then, you know, some of those we adopt, we end up absorbing into our culture. And so mm-hmm. like we end up almost having pride in proving a stereotype. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I think man, there's yeah. a little bit of that that might go on in different ethnic groups in Japan, too. And and gosh, to try to learn about any other. I mean, eth- Okinawa, the only reason why we generally know about them in the West is because of the war. Right. But mm-hmm. like and the fact that there's a U.S. base there. But there's, you know, other 
ethnic groups in Japan that just like, Shh, we don't, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. don't, you know, don't look over there. <laughs> so if they're doing it to their own population, you know, how it's, it, it's so hard to be from the outside of that and try to fight mm-hmm. it in. And then if you're a hybrid like me, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I mean, talk about, we don't want to talk about something, you know, yeah. like that's, you know, I'm definitely one of those, we don't want to talk about type of thing. So this stuff, it's, it's hard to see it, but Uh, As a mixed person who is mixed with a group that is against your other groups, you know, Mm -hmm. like I, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm British too. Like, yeah, like I'm mixed with so many colonizers, the Japan, the Japanese and the British. And then I'm mixed with the oppressed, the Welsh who are oppressed by English, British, um, the Irish and the Scottish, you know, also oppressed by Mm -hmm. the English, British, uh, I'm black, you know, like, like <laughs> you're both you're both like on the right side and wrong side across your family and it, yeah. it you know when you're experiencing that in your own family and then you try to make a make an expectation about a whole culture like japan i need you to start doing this um it's like yeah that's cute i've even been asked like what's it like to know uh like the stereotypical question that yeah. some of your ancestors owned the other ones and i'm like honestly i'm gonna be real i don't think about it because there's way more pertinent actual things happening between right. my family like today like and that's even more concerning. if it's true okay yeah like you what know a- like okay that's all i can say about it my great grandfather my great great twice great great grandfather was massa Oh, wow. I know See? this. Uh-huh. We know it in our family. Okay, fine. Um, part of me wants to say, I don't like, besides knowing that, I don't know anything about them. So, mm-hmm. in the same way that, like, what I know about my family is what I know. And, uh, okay, I, I, I'm not, re- <laughs> I'm not able to, to put it into words. Like, I don't know anything different. All I know is I've had these stories passed down from, from all these generations that mm-hmm. say, this is what happened. And then it puts a different context on like my great grandmother, who I did also know on my black side, um, of why she looked the way she looked, why she was the way she was and things like that. And all I can say is that, okay, yes, her father was what he was, mm-hmm. but what she was, was a very strong, you know, mother of six to probably nine kids, depending on who survived, um, mm-hmm. with a husband that was not present. And then when he was present, wasn't the best. And yet she endured and she lived into, you know, being 96. And I know that I got something from her. Mm-hmm. That's what I know. Um, I'm not going to deny what happened before. I'm not going to mm-hmm. pretend it didn't exist. Uh, same on the Japanese side. You know, I, I am a hundred percent sure that I have Japanese family members that committed atrocities across mm. Korea, J- China, Philippines, and things like that. I, you know, they were in the military. Absolutely would expect that. I don't know those stories. I know it's there. I can't deny it. Mm. You know, and I, and all I can do is try to be as good a person as I can, and also not try to erase that it happened. You know, right. I'm not going to pretend that it didn't happen. Um, for the sake of, you know, making me feel a little bit more comfortable, you know, like, mm-hmm. you, I mean, sh- shit, my dad was an asshole. So mm-hmm. if I can accept the fact that I had a terrible father, then, you know, it's nothing for me to accept the fact that an ancestor that was dead far before I came around mm-hmm. did some terrible stuff. But what I'm not going to do is deny it. You know, I think that's a difference in any kind of supremacist culture is that they can't say it, you know, they mm-hmm. can't own it. Um, yeah, for sure. As a way of reparations, they can't own it as a way of reparations. They might really own it as a look what we yeah. did, you know, mm-hmm. but they might not be able to accept it as a as a form of reparations. And, you know, I know it's a little bit off topic, but it's there. It's there. It's, yeah, it's, no, in, for it's sure. in anime, too. And it's in it's in nerd culture also. Yeah, no, these things definitely inform, you know, the pop culture, because before I got into like K-dramas and started exploring these other like pieces of East Asian media, I really had only been into anime as far as Asian media is concerned. I'm a nerd in a lot of other other areas. Oh, I guess in video games. But, you know, seeing a completely different cultural context that where the pop culture is built around 
a, a lot of it's built around, you know, processing the trauma as the mm-hmm. oppressed versus mm-hmm. having taken in all this, you know, media from Japan where they are the colonizer. And yes, mm-hmm. like their pop culture is a response to uh, the bomb, of course, but also like they were. In, they were the they were the which, colonizer. Which like, we can put parallels into what's happening in our world right now. Yep. Um, the we very sure much can. oppressed uh, <laughs> Jewish people are now the oppressors. And yep in yep. Palestine and you know like it sucks that the world the the stuff is both cyclical and you know that that line from the dark knight pops up you know you either you know die the hero or live long live enough long to enough. become the villain and mm-hmm. um in in Japan's case I think it was the villain that became the hero to a degree but still doing villainy you know mm-hmm. and you know I guess that's kind of what seems to be playing out with uh with Israel right now as well um <sighs> yeah like like being the oppressed gives you permission in some way to become that it, it happens in America too between you know our cultural relations which is also something we talk about here on this podcast the mm-hmm. the triangulation of whiteness when it comes to our different cultural backgrounds and all that stuff et cetera, et cetera. white supremacy reign supreme <laughs> yeah yeah but it but in ner- in nerddom i i would say that um it gives you both like joy and representation at the same time that it can kind of rip you apart and, yep. and, and, you know, misrepresent. And so I guess with everything, any kind of media you consume, any kind of activity you participate, there's the positive and negative version of it across the board. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, even in, you know, sports, it, that yep. kind of stuff happens too. I don't know why we seek out he- hero and villain stories. So, so heavily as a, as a global culture, but, um, but in trying to take the parts of nerd of the different nerd cultures that I, that I love. Um, I tend to be on, I tend to be on the do for community side of things like sacrifice for others, mm-hmm. be of service. Like even the, even the, the types of characters I consume do that mm-hmm. kind of stuff, which is the same kind of stuff I'm trying to do in real life. Um, but they do it in a fantasy version of it. Uh, Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think at at the end of the day, that's that's where like, yeah, all this toxicity and all this stuff that exists in my in my fandom. Yes, I understand it exists. And yet uh, here's this joyful bit that I get out of it. And and that's the part that I'm trying to, I guess, elevate and or or share or just live in for a minute. Like I've had the most fun dressing up as a character that I enjoy. Um. And seeing a person react to me dressing up in it. I don't I didn't expect that to be a part of it. But man, having a Psylocke yell, Jubilee from like <laughs> three tiers over and then like run towards me to ask me to take a photo, I was like, Yeah, okay. I get it. I that get it. Is one of this the most- is what you do. This is why you fan. You know, like it's fun. Absolutely. It's one of the purest interactions, in my opinion, that you can have. So if you've not been to a con, even if you're not going to cosplay, like go to a con. Go to a con, yeah. Pay attention to the cosplayers because when you see that cosplayer who's cosplaying one of your favorite characters and doing it so well, and all you can do, like it's a childlike joy that you feel, and you're like, oh my gosh, so and so. Like it's, uh, it's just the best. It really is. Like you wonder, like why can't we just be like this all the time? time. Why why do we have like certain (laughs) ways that we dress? Because if I could just walk around, you know, in in a getup like that or something at some point, like I I remember leaving. Uh, New York Comic Con when I was dressed as a I was a hybrid Joker Loki I called myself mm-hmm. Jokey um, so I had a Joker style outfit in green so I was I was being Joker with Loki accoutrement mm-hmm. um, I had my my horns and everything like that and I was walking around I had my face painting and and uh, I leave New York Comic Con and I'm staying far away from the con because um, I wanted to be in a different part of the city and I just go into like a sandwich shop dressed as jokey. <laughs> and I, I for, kind of forget. It kind of goes away. Like even though mm-hmm. the horns are like hanging off my head and stuff like that. I'm just like, dude, dude, can I get a little sandwich and stuff? And the girl looks up at me and she's like, I'm sure there's a reason for this. <laughs> and I was like, Comic Con. And she goes, oh, that's right. Yeah. And then she just hands me my money back and we, <laughs> you know, exchange done or whatever. And I was like, you know, I wasn't ridiculed. I was mm-hmm. obviously weird in that moment compared to the rest of the people. But like now she'll have a story of that. And then this, <laughs> you know, this person <laughs> rolled up dresses. 
I guess Joker or something like that. You know, like I, I know that not everybody got what I was if they weren't at the con. And I just love like having this kind of thing. Like if I could just be a regular person that could walk around in, in costume all the time, I think, um, I think that would be a fun life. <laughs> I have uh, later this season, I'm having my friend come on and that's kind of her whole thing. She calls her style like nerdy, whimsical, casual, nerdy, whimsy, something like mm -hmm. that. Um, and I want to talk to her about that because that's what she does is she like takes like nerdy properties and like walks that boundary i would say between cosplay and like everyday clothes and okay. just wears them like That's that all dope. the time yeah no it's super dope and i you know love her to death she's one of my best friends um and i like feel so inspired by her, her i'm not a fashionable person first and foremost but <laughs> it inspires me to push the envelope and be like why can't we like we should just embrace the fun and the whimsy right. of nerdiness and like yeah. what fandom can bring into our day-to-day -day life like why not you know what i'm saying <laughs> You know, if I catch somebody and you do on occasion, like catch somebody who like all they're doing is wearing air, elf ears or something like mm -hmm. that. Right. Like that's all that's all it is. They're regular dressed. And and so and you just look at them and I want to be able to say with all the love and support in my heart and just look at them and be like, you fucking nerd. And just move <laughs> yes. on with my day. You know, like I want to be able to like I see you, nerd. I'm a nerd, mm -hmm. too. Thank you for just, you know showing up in your ears you. today mm -hmm. or something like I I really enjoy that and I think um you know being uh like a welfare kid a mixed black kid being an abused child and stuff like that like mm. I didn't have a whole lot of whimsy in mm -hmm. in my childhood so I'm trying to recapture it as much as possible in my adulthood which is not always easy and I'm, I'm also 45 and so sometimes there's these moments of being like you know you hear the thing that says you should be more mature. And then part of me is like, I was really mature at a really young age, mm -hmm. but you know what? Spider-Man <laughs> is going to sit on my desk and stare at me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just need, um, I need to be able to just look over and not have to be serious all the time because my life is very serious. You know, I'm a, mm -hmm. I'm a podcaster that talks about race and identity. I'm a liberationist. I'm, I'm, a elevator in terms of activism and stuff like that mm -hmm. this is this is heavy work and i want to be able sometimes to like stare over at my rubber ducky collection and just be like hmm. you know like <laughs> I, just, I just want that kind of stuff and I, I would like to be able to have a little bit more whimsy in my adulthood if i could um it's tough but you know you put it where you put it uh but getting an opportunity to to share my nerdom with other people not just on my shows but you know shows like yours or mm -hmm. or walk around a con and and know that I got someone excited um just because they saw that I did a good job that's the other part it's like especially if I piece it together if I mm -hmm. versus buying a package thing because with like Shinobu I bought a package because there was no way I was going to be able to put that together but mm -hmm. um my joker or my joke jokey uh, or my Jubilee or my Gambit. Those were ones like I pieced every single separate thing together to make it work. And when I see an adult or a child's eyes light up when they see me, I'm just like, I did it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like that pat on the back that you need, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, for uh, sure. It's fun. Well, before we get out of here, I had one last question. Well, okay. I have two questions, actually, technically. I was wondering if there was something you could tell monoracial people mm. th that you wish that they knew about being mixed or specific to you, mixed Black and Japanese that they may not know or that they need to know. That is, it's not important that they're curious. It's, it's okay. none of their business. You know, mm -hmm. like, yes. Um, I, I don't understand the fascination, uh, but for whatever reason, this is a predominantly monoracial thing where mm -hmm. they look at us and because they can't put us in a box easily, they, they have all these other questions. Um, they clearly have enough of an eye to be able to look at one of us and say, mm, you know, like <laughs> what you say you are and what you look like, isn't it? You know, they have that, but but that they have it in a view of the other every time mm -hmm. that their curiosity, they think it's welcoming, but it's it's actually othering. Mm -hmm. And so what I want monoracial people to to be to understand is that uh, we do not owe you an explanation. You can sit in your discomfort. You can sit in your confusion. You can even sit in your curiosity. I don't care. Um, 
I can share with you. But in sharing with you, I'm sometimes helping you continue to other me or other people. So Mm -hmm. if I choose to not tell you what I am, or if I choose to tell you that it's not your business to ask, or it's not your place, or it's inappropriate for you to ask, I'm not being contrary. I'm not being rude or anything like that. I'm actually protecting my community uh, when I do and say things like that. And so, yeah, what I would love moderational people to understand about mixed people is that we're none of your business. <laughs> I love it. That's where I've lived for for many, many years. And mm-hmm. I 100% agree. Again, I've adjusted how I'm moving through that. But mm-hmm. in general, it's like, your. why is your curiosity my problem? That is something I've always thought to myself. Yeah. So I think that's great advice. Um, if somebody and also, I'm just gonna have my two cents. If somebody chooses to share their background with you, if they're, you know, multiracial, biracial, mixed, however they identify, like that's special. And that means that's they a trust special you. Thing. Yeah. So honor that, please. Yeah. Don't be <laughs> the weird. best that you can. Don't touch yeah. don't touch hair. Don't touch don't skin. Don't touch hair. Don't oh my gosh. Yes. Don't don't do any of those things. <laughs> don't do any of those things. <laughs> Ever in general, just, but even especially just if then. it's in your head, you'd be like, because I do it too. I look at people and I'm like, I bet they're mixed. But what do I do? Keep it fucking moving because yep, I they keep didn't it need my curiosity to get in the way of their day to day. You know, I don't as a, as a Japanese person, one thing that does is pretty heavy in my culture is that you don't inflict yourself on others. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and I say I use inflict very intentionally because if I just come in here and decide to be like, you're not a nerd because you're femme or something like that, you know, like, why? Mm-hmm. What? why did you bring that to me today? Cause what I was doing was just sitting here being my nerdy ass self. And I didn't, I didn't need that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't try to inflict myself. um, If I can avoid it, you know, like I do my best. Uh, You can't help it. Your presence sometimes does that. Uh, But like, unless I'm in a situation where there's been enough of a Bible exchange that I can say, Hey, I'm a mixed person. This is my mix. Are you mixed also? You know, I'll, I'll put it where the burden is on me first. And Mm -hmm. then, you know, if I'm if I'm going to go that route, you know, I'm going to put it on me first and then bring it to you. Uh, but what I'm not going to do is hit you up on the street while I'm just walking to get a soda <laughs> and be like, what kind of Mexican are you? <laughs> Which literally happens. <laughs> it absolutely does. Uh, yeah, well, no, it happens all the, it time. all the time. <laughs> I uh, get Dominican all of the time. My me whole too, life. Yeah. It's been Dominican and Dominican people even being like, stop Dominicans, lying. Listen, my heart. <laughs> Dominican people, like the way they are angrily trying to own me (laughs) and like bring me into the fold where they're like, they will aggressively scream at me, especially in New York. This is where I get it the most. But they'll aggressively scream like, you you don't love yourself because you're not embracing your people. And I'm like, I'm literally black and Japanese, bro. I understand that my (laughs) yellow brown face is telling you that I'm black. I know that it is. And that's confusing for you because, you know, sometimes your culture doesn't think you're black, even though you're black. Mm -hmm. I get it. But Trust me. <laughs> I'm not like I I hear you. I'm sure that's a problem for some people, I but it is not me. <laughs> and listen, I love that I'm being embraced. You know, I Truly. appreciate it. Absolutely. <laughs> and I, you know, I ain't mad at it, except that I also like to be my authentic self. And if yep. you're telling me that I can't be because I'm I'm a de- I'm a self-hating Dominican. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost to the point where sometimes I'm like, I wish I could tell you I was because you really you know like, the like at least somebody wow. loves me out on yeah. these streets. Like, you know, uh, but um, but yeah, but I, alas, I am not. But yeah, I get all the time. And then when I like started, I'm like, why do I keep getting this? Because I didn't live around. That was the other thing. I didn't even live around a lot of Dominicans. But yeah. then started knowing Dominicans. I was like, actually, yeah, uh, we could be like yeah. cousins, like for real. Like, what is up? <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, it's being like an a person that has obvious black features, but not all the black features, you know Mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like, it's not, it's, it's, it's that there's, it's a subtleness to it or whatever, because that's what I say that I would get that over. Well, it's around like you're, you're deemed whatever Latin you're closest to. And in LA I'm closer to Mexican. So people will be like, are you Mexican? But they knew it was wrong because I didn't quite, look like them but then if i go on the east coast they have more dominicans and puerto ricans there and they'll be like oh that's the kind of latin that makes sense to me latins with black features and uh and so it doesn't matter that my skin is as yellow or light as it is i'm coding similar Mm -hmm. so that's why but yeah dominicans in particular are aggressive about taking possession of me (laughs) and uh 
I appreciate it. I do, but also I feel the love, but also <laughs> I just said E because I'm living in Mexico. So now I'm starting to speak Spanish. Um, e Coco Jean. So, you know, well, thank you so much for joining me. It was a blast. We had a great conversation. Go ahead, Charmaine, tell people where they can find you, plug your stuff, your new podcast. <laughs> All my stuff. So uh, if you want to find any of my podcasts, they're usually named pretty pretty well for what they are. Um, Militantly Mixed, at Militantly Mixed on all of the social media platforms. Uh, Blurred Comics, which is B-L-E-R-D-C-O-M-I-X-E-D, as in mixed black comic book nerds uh <laughs> and uh, my latest show matcha masala at matcha masala which is a true crime podcast uh we are a couple of mixed mates musing over matcha masala and murder because we're <laughs> we're two mixed people who are obsessive tea drinkers and also really into true crime <laughs> and we like alliteration <laughs> I'm obsessed with the name. I love it. I don't so personally go to true crime, is, but is Indian. And yeah. she's actually Indian Welsh and um and lives in England. Uh, she goes by mixed race mama on the on the social. She has her own mm-hmm. podcast. And then I'm black Japanese, British American. So we both have the British connection in terms of our tea consumption. But then I'm Japanese, so matcha, and she's Indian, so masala. And uh, yeah, we just we have a fantasy of driving through their English countryside, solving murders as like a a buddy cop. Um, type of detectiveness you know matcha and masala i hope somebody fan arts this for you like yes. listen to the podcast when it comes out and please make yeah. that fan art because that's yeah. a lovely story it's so fun <laughs> you know we'll just have our little cups of tea and you know <laughs> fake mustaches and we'll just like let's solve this murder with the yeah. cap the sherlock holmes like cap <laughs> yeah, it'll be so much fun but yeah that's, that's my latest show uh and if you want to follow me and you see some of my cosplay which has really been um on pause since i moved to mexico uh but i'm hopefully getting back into it because my sewing machine is here now uh Ooh. you can follow me on the blasian blur d-a-b-l-a-s-i-n-b-l-e-r-d on the internets um because that's where that's where a lot of my nerd stuff goes absolutely go follow go go check out all the podcasts again big fan thank you so much for coming and Thanks thank you all me. yeah for sure and thank you all so much for listening you know what it is let me know what you thought you can find me at culture x podcast on instagram definitely at the time of recording i don't know by the time whenever you're listening to this if twitter even exists but it's there too <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, until next time, y'all keep it chill and keep it nerdy.